Yeah. Hello, everyone. It's Francis Whittleson here. Welcome to Rational Space Disputations. And for people who are unaware of the format, uh, what happens is every week or so, I invite on someone whose work is interesting or who I admire. And uh, we have the situation whereby I interview the guest for an hour. And then after an hour, the guest is able to interview me for an hour just to make everything fair and to cover off anything that was left out in the first discussion that happened. So for today's guest, I have Dr. Ian Gentles. Welcome, Ian. It's good to be with you, Francis. And Ian, um, I've known Ian actually for a long time <laughs> because I was Ian's research assistant back well for one sesh for one segment uh, doing research on Air France um, back in I guess it was the 2000s, early 2000s. And uh, Ian, at that time, uh, was a professor of history at York University, Glendon College, I believe, at York University. He was a history professor there for 45 years. And then, I believe more recently, he has uh, been at Tyndale University in Toronto, and he's been there for 12 years. So what I think would be a good idea, Ian, is for you to uh, tell us something about yourself, what you're interested in, um, just so we can get a good sense of well, the kinds of things you study and, and what, what, you, what you are examining. Well, thank you, Francis. At, uh, at York and at Tyndale, I, I was appointed as an early modern British historian. I taught mainly uh, Britain from 1500 to 1800, although I did teach the whole of British history. I also taught ancient history. I taught the history of population, uh, a, a subject uh, in which I continue to be fascinated. And uh, I taught urban history for a while. I taught in French for a while. I've, I take pride in keeping up my French. Uh, and at Tyndale, which is a small independent Christian university, in Toronto, I also taught the history of Christianity. So I've really covered a lot of ground. I'm a bit of a generalist. Mm. I've, but my main research and writing, my certainly my professional academic research and writing has been on the English Revolution, 1640 to 1660. It was really, I think, the first of the great uh, revolutions of modern times, the others being the French, and then the Russian, and finally the Chinese. I think those are the four great revolutions of modern times. Um, and in many ways, the English Revolution sort of set the pattern for others, although they went to much greater extremes. The, the cost in terms of human life was much greater with each succeeding revolution. But, uh, and I've written, uh, I've written a book, which is now in its second edition. It's just come out. Uh, the New Model Army, Agent of Revolution, just came out with Yale a couple of months ago. And uh, I've written a biography of Oliver Cromwell, which I am again rewriting as in a second edition. And I've written a general book on the English Revolution and various articles on, on aspects of the English Revolution. So that's uh, what I know about professionally and academically, but I have uh, other interests as well. Uh, I have a longstanding interest in the subject of abortion, and I'm, I'm keenly interested in what the US Supreme Court is going to hand down a, as its decision in the, in the current cases that are before it from Mississippi and Texas. And I've actually been reading the leaked opinion of the Supreme Court, which is utterly scathing in its, <laughs> in its dismissal of the Roe v. Wade decision of 1973. And, and uh, I, I, think, I think everybody who's actually interested in this issue, and many, many people are, should mm. read what the current Supreme Court or the majority of the current Supreme Court think about Roe v. Wade. And it's actually refreshing because I think that in that case, sending 
the abortion issue back to the state so that each individual state can make its own policies mm-hmm. will will defuse the issue and mm-hmm. and basically heal a running sore that's been going on for the last 50 years in in uh, in the american body politic my the other issue i'm interested in is is or the other two issues are euthanasia about which i've also written and here in canada the indian residential schools yeah. about which uh, well i approach it with trepidation because <laughs> there's so much fury and so much anger and and battle lines drawn yes. on this issue yeah uh, but i'm i'm sort of gearing up and i'm trying to do some proper research yeah. with the help of of many members of this discussion group of which yep. you are also a member yes. you're a leading yep. member of this yep. discussion group which is doing research yep. and, and writing articles and books trying to correct the dominant narrative about the indian residential schools being places of misery and exploitation and abuse and just general suffering and and the origin of all the modern problems facing indigenous society um, yes. so I'm I'm very I just think a terrible injustice has been done on this dominant narrative which is so heavily promoted by the federal government the CBC the Globe and Mail the academy in general uh, with honorable exceptions like yourself mm-hmm. and a few others it's interesting that most of the people who dissent from the stifling dominant narrative about the residential schools are retired or dismissed or have been retired academics because there's no room for them in the modern university the modern university will not tolerate uh, any criticism of the dominant narrative so Mm -hmm. the only people who can get away with being critical are people who are not employed by the university namely retired or fired people yes okay so ian I think we'll start with the least controversial and then move forward to the most controversial in terms of this discussion. Um, So revolutions, which I'm very interested as well. I'm very interested to talk to you because as you know, I'm a historical materialist. So I would come at revolutions somewhat differently than yourself. But um, I was wondering if you could, first of all, just kind of state what, what you think a revolution is in comparison to other forms of social change, social upheaval, yeah. which are not revolutionary. Yes. Well, there, there is such a thing as a quiet revolution, but mm-hmm. normally a revolution is a violent upheaval, which occurs in a short period of time. It's, it's usually sudden and it takes place in a compressed uh, time period of a, of a few years at the most. And it turns society upside down. It um, transforms social relationships. It transforms the dominant ideology of the society. It uh, redistributes wealth. It redistributes political power. And it does so in a very sudden and violent way. That's, that's what a revolution is. Mm. Uh, a gradual change over many years, which may accomplish the same things, of overturning the dominant narrative, overturning overturning the dominant ideology, redistributing wealth, redis- uh, rearranging social relationships. If this takes place over a period of many centuries, as it has mm. in some countries, then it it you might call it a quiet revolution, or it's just not a revolution; it's an evolution. Mm. But England, unexpectedly, because it was one of the more peaceful I wouldn't, wouldn't say it was completely peaceful it had its uh, it, it had its civil wars the wars of the roses for example it had its social conflict it had its power struggles within the elite within the nobility trying to overthrow various monarchs for example this had all taken place over a period of centuries but suddenly mm. in 1640 parliament ro- parliament rose up against the king charles the first and challenged him. And he, of course, 
he accepted their challenge. And in fact, he initiated war against parliament. He declared war, he declared violent war against parliament because he said that they had become impossible to work with and he had to get rid of them and find a new parliament that mm. wasn't so recalcitrant and rebellious and, and uh, so impossible to work with. Mm -hmm. So the long parliament meets in 1640, civil war breaks out in 1642, and this civil war goes on and really becomes a revolution within a short period of time, costing 80,000 lives in Britain, something like 50,000 lives in Scotland, because it, it takes place within the three nations, the three kingdoms, as they were called at that time, and well over 300,000 lives in Ireland. Ireland always seems to suffer the most. Mm -hmm. And so why was all this killing taking place? Well, it was partly because of religion. Ideas, Francis, are actually very important. <laughs> <laughs> Marxists, even Marxists recognize that ideas can not, be the uh, engine of history. Uh, yes, yes? Well, it's not uh, in the last instance, like it's kind of like the, the causality. That's kind of the, the argument that goes on is that what is the most significant yes. kind of element. Um, and uh, the state. So that's the other thing. Yes. What about the, like often we hear about revolutions being there's a change in the state, in control over the state. Would you see it that way? Well, this is a historical materialist. Position. Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, you, you have basically three nodal points of power. You have the monarch. And at that time, the, the king of Spain and the king of France were absolute monarchs. And they governed uh, without challenge. Mm -hmm. Charles I because of English tradition, had to get along with Parliament. Uh, he could not pass legislation without the consent of the House of Commons, which is the uh, body that represents the non-titled classes of England, and the House of Lords, which is the upper house of Parliament, which represents the nobility. Uh, and so it's, it's a kind of tripartite government. He is trying to Reduce, reduce their powers and he's modeling himself on the king of France. They, on the other hand, say, no, 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 we have this very honorable tradition of parliamentary government and we wanna preserve it, especially since we don't trust you on religious matters. You've married a French Catholic, Henrietta mm -hmm. Maria, who was the sister of the French king. And we being fierce Protestants as, 80 to 90% of them were in parliament, mm. don't trust the king. And we, we think that you're trying to steer us in, in, into becoming a Roman Catholic power. And that really was more divisive than any other issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also a power struggle. It was a material power struggle uh, in that the gentry, the non-titled uh, landed class, in alliance with the merchants and the lawyers were challenging the aristocracy and the monarchy yep. for uh, material dominance. Because don't forget the, um, the aristocracy controlled roughly a quarter of the land of England and the, the crown controlled roughly a quarter of the land of England. And the gentry were throwing their weight around and becoming increasingly powerful and increasingly uh, defiant against the monarchy and to yeah. some extent, the nobility. So it's, uh, it's, it is partly a class struggle, partly. Oh, sorry, the gentry, what, what is the gentry? I'm, I'm just, I, I, I get these terms mixed up sometimes. So well, you have the kind of the aristocracy, which would contain the, the monarch and the, the various titled people, right? titled. The, the earls and so on. That's right. The earls. And then we have the gentry. Who, and who, who is the gentry? They are the landed class who don't have titles. Okay. Uh, now, the, the landed class who do have titles are a very powerful element in British society at this time. Yeah. 
Nonetheless, the gentry are increasing in power and influence and the amount of land they control. And so they're they are demanding corresponding and were they, and were they power. Capitalists? Were they capitalists or no? Well, they are agrarian capitalists in that they have a, a, an underclass of, of tenants mm. uh, ranging from yeomen down to uh, tenants who own no land and, and simply function as agricultural laborers working on yearly contracts for these gentry. Gentry is simply a plural noun for gentlemen. It's another, gentleman it's another farmer. word. Yeah, <laughs> gentlemen farmers. Oliver Cromwell was a minor gentleman farmer. He only had a few hundred acres. Some of these guys had uh, a thousand or two thousand acres and they had um, dozens and dozens of tenants yeah. Uh, whom uh, you could say they exploited, right? They 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 drew rents and 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 forced the tenants to to hand over anywhere from a third to a half of their produce, yeah. and that's how the, the gentry survived and lived in these magnificent country houses. And yeah. and they were the ones who ran county society. They were the ones who got elected to parliament. Um, they plus a few lawyers and a few merchants from okay. places like London, but overwhelmingly it's the gentry who dominate the House of Commons, okay. and it's the gentry who are the engine behind the English Revolution. Except that when it starts to become very radicalized around 1647. Mm -hmm. um, they they start to say, hey, 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 we didn't mean to go this far. <laughs> uh, we, we certainly didn't want to <laughs> democratize the elections to the House of Commons. And we certainly didn't want to equalize the social classes. This has gone much too far. Yeah. Whereas people in the New Model Army, which is the army of Oliver Cromwell and, and Thomas Fairfax, his fellow general, they were imbibing these extremely radical political views from a, a group in London called the Levelers, who, as their name suggests, that wasn't the name they gave themselves, of course, mm, yeah. <clears throat> but um, they called themselves radical independents. But they, they wanted the dismantling of monopolies, for example. They wanted the, a radical extension of the franchise. So that more and more people and, could and were vote. they part of the gentry or were they something else? The levelers. They okay. The levelers represented what were at the time called the middling sort of people. Now, what are the middling sort of people? Skilled craftsmen, mm. um, uh, lower level merchants, tradesmen, mm. uh, urban. They're sort of the urban skilled working class okay. um, uh, who are educated, they're literate, mm. um, and, and they think for themselves. Unlike the rural proletariat who are so exhausted from working <laughs> from dawn till dusk that they really don't have time to think about politics. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think they could for quite some time, unless you own property, yeah, didn't yeah. hold office, right? That was that was one of the conditions of. of no, the they did, they didn't hold office. Although, some of them, you know, some of these um, urban um, dwellers who were quite low down the social scale, they did get appointed as church wardens occasionally, constables. Each parish had its own constable, mm. and it's a, it was an unpaid appointment, but it carried a certain weight and prestige. And so people fairly far down the social scale would, would get appointed to these lowly positions. Mm. And they had, for example, the experience of voting in their um, vestry meetings, in other words, the annual meeting of the, of the church as, as a congregation. So there's a kind of primitive experience of democracy uh, mm. that goes quite far down the social scale in English society. Yeah. So like, like, there, I've seen, um, the I've ideas seen talks, that, yeah. I've, I've seen interesting talks about um, sort of the legal system in, uh -huh. in the UK or I guess in England is the most where this was taking place, but all the kinds of, 
um, court proceedings and everything that would happen and these huge, you know, scrolls yeah. of, of all the meticulous records. And it's quite extraordinary when you think, you know, that, um, you know, that was quite a long time ago, but, but still quite established kind of common law, fair kind of recorded principles sort of thing. Yes, yeah, uh, going of, back to the 12th century. Yeah. And the, uh, the astonishing thing is, and this isn't recognized by many people, including historical scholars, uh, quite poor people could have access to the legal system. There was a, a court called the Court of Requests, which was called the poor man's court. But not only did relatively poor people have access to the court of requests where you know there were no lawyers you went and argued your own case mm. but even as an elevated court like the court of king's bench which is one of the top courts in england the court of king's bench regularly heard very ordinary suits from from poor people yeah it's quite astonishing and and in fact even a marxist historian like e.p thompson has to yeah had to recognize he's dead now Mm. had to recognize that the English legal system actually did cater to people very far down the social system, social mm. class system. Yeah. So, but to get back to the English Revolution, uh, the, the soldiers and especially the junior officers in the new model army are imbibing these radical social ideas mm. and political ideas from the levelers. Mm. And they're increasingly coming to see Charles as a traitor to his own people, especially when he, he's defeated in the first civil war, 1646. But then a year or so later, he's, he starts up the war again, thinking he can win this time. Well, of course they trounce him a second time and they're so furious at him for having started the war a second time that they say, uh, nothing will do. This man is is totally untrustworthy. He's a traitor to his own people. We must bring him to justice. So they create a court called the High Court of Justice, unprecedented, totally illegal court. They purge Parliament of all the people who oppose bringing the king to justice, and then they appoint, simply arbitrarily appoint, 135 commissioners to hear the case against the king. <clears throat> and of course, it's a total put up job. The king is duly found guilty of treason against the English people for which the punishment is death. Yeah. And he is beheaded in public as Oliver Cromwell boasted. This was not something done in a <laughs> corner. This was something done in the full light of day. And the rest of Europe is aghast yeah. that, that the English people have actually brought their monarch to the scaffold and decapitated him yeah. and proclaimed a republic. Mm. They've abolished the House of Lords. Mm. They've abolished the monarchy. And they set up a republic, which lasts for 11 years. And this is, I assume, with Cromwell, that was the uh, re republic. Uh, he emerges as the, the head of it. He doesn't want to be called king because they've just got rid of the monarchy. Oh. So he allows himself to be called <laughs> Lord Protector. Yes. But yeah. he kind of operates as pretty much like a king, and, although he does try to involve parliament. He has terrible conflicts with parliament. And a couple of times he expels them and calls a new one. But anyway, he dies in 1658. His son succeeds, who is hopeless, uh, nowhere near the man his father was. And finally, and this is the great irony, which I try and bring out in my book, mm. General Monk, who's the leading general in the New Model Army at this point, rises up against his fellow generals and says, you know, we've been trying to run this country and we haven't been doing a very good job of it. And it's high time that we turned political power back to the civil authority. In other words, call Parliament back and hand over power to them. And so he marches down from Scotland where he is based and everybody basically caves in in front of him. And when he gets to London, he advances his agenda. He's no longer 
really in favor of recalling Parliament mm. because he has been active in negotiations with the king's son, the exiled Charles II, who at that point is in France. And he very, very, very delicately negotiates the return of Charles II under various conditions, which Charles has to accept and mm. does, and then goes down in May 1660 and welcomes Charles at Dover, where he arrives, uh, and goes th through this charade of begging apology from the king for, for everything they've done in the last cutting 11 his years. <laughs> <laughs> cutting his father's head off. <laughs> and the king plays uh -huh. along with the charade and forgives Monk, and in fact, rewards him with a dukedom, uh, all kinds of land, okay. uh, makes him um, admiral of the Navy yeah. and, and gives him tons of money. So, and this is all done as, as one perceptive commentator at the time observes without anybody suffering so much as a bloody nose. In other words, it's a totally peaceful restoration. The, mm -hmm. the new model army, which had been breathing fire and brimstone for so many years in the end, just collapses. Why? Well, because they can sense that overwhelmingly public opinion want the monarch back. They want a return to stability. They want the good old days. That's what they want. And it's kind so of like- The whole period, like the 11 years yeah. was a very unstable time. It was an unstable time, yes. And, and yes. Is, that, is that due to kind of other factors, economic factors and so on, or is that due to them having lost the glue that used to hold their society together in your view? Like what, what, what was, why was it so unstable for those 11 years? Well, partly because the people who used to be the ruling class, the gentry mm -hmm. um, and the nobility who are still around, even though they no longer have their titles and they no longer have the House of Lords, uh, uh, don't, uh, they have no confidence in this republic, even though the republic is going out and fighting France and fighting Spain and mm. conquering Scotland and conquering Ireland uh, and really distinguishing itself militarily uh, uh, in, a, in a tremendous way. But at enormous cost, the country is going deeper and deeper into debt. And by the end of the 1650s, mm. the England cannot get itself out of debt, at least under the existing Republican system. Mm. And that's another reason for the collapse. That's, if you like, that's one of the profound mm. material reasons for the yeah. collapse that the government is simply yeah. bankrupt. Mm. Yeah, Dude, what just sounds like a little bit of overextension in terms of wars and yes. so on. Being yes, caught. yes. And, it, and it, it's sort of an analogous to the collapse of the Soviet regime in 1989, mm -hmm. which again happened with no bloodshed, right? This, this tremendous communist system, which everybody thought was invincible and impregnable, suddenly within the space of a couple of years, mm -hmm. collapses and is replaced by something radically different. Mm -hmm. Same thing in England in 1659-60. Yeah. Total collapse. Yeah. So do you, uh, do you see it somewhat as a, the transition from feudalism to capitalism? Like that's how I always kind of thought of these, especially yeah. the, the that's, French That's revolution. very much a Marxist interpretation and there's some validity to it because yeah. uh, what, the, what the Republic did was it basically uh, abolished feudal tenures. Yeah. And now what are feudal tenures? Feudal tenures are, uh, all, all land is held of the king, and in return for holding land from the king, you owe him military service. Mm. So there's no such thing as outright land ownership. It's mm -hmm. all conditional. It all comes from the king, ultimately, and it all has a price. Every significant piece of land has a price tag, namely, you have to serve the king in war. Well. Mm. The, the English Revolution gets rid of that. It gets rid of feudal tenures. So in that sense, it is a transition from feudalism to capitalism. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
anyway, so we've got we've used up a bit of time, Ian. So I don't want to I don't want to miss out on all the other uh, uh, <laughs> subjects. Yep. So let's move on to um, abortion. Yeah. So, so what is your what's your view on abortion? Well, first of all, I'll mention that abortion is has been called the third rail in Canadian politics. And that's yes. a reference <laughs> to the fact that in subways, I'm not sure other electrical transport systems, you have the two rails that are the tracks and then you have the third rail which transmits the electrical power and yeah. you don't dare touch that third nope. rail because you'll be uh, instantly electrocuted. And uh, you were uh, saying that it, you couldn't, yeah, for many years at the universe, this is of interest to me just because, although I, I got to put my cards on the table, I'm pro-choice and I, I don't, yeah. I'm, uh, which, you know, most people are, I guess, in Canadian society. Um, I, I'm kind of appalled that people feel that they can't discuss abortion in a university. Like oh, that would no. be one of the big sort of moral questions to be, have debates about and everything like that. Yeah, so it's an important yeah. moral question. And you and I can be on opposite sides yeah. of the fence and we respect each other. And, sure. and we can lay our cards down and say, well, this is what I believe. And you can yeah. say, this is what I believe. And, and we can have a civilized discussion, but that's not possible in the <laughs> academy. I, it was, it was, now you may say, well, how do you know this, Ian? Well, I just knew that nobody in my institution uh, had any tolerance for any discussion of abortion because as far as they were concerned, uh, it was obvious what side the truth was on, and anybody who questioned the, the morality or the advisability of abortion was either anti-woman or simply um, um, uh, some kind of southern redneck who didn't deserve the time of day. Mm -hmm. And so even though I, I did a lot of work, I, I, I did some profound study with, and I had a lot of um, assistance because I was connected to a bioethics institute called the bio, the Deweber Institute for Bioethics. And we harnessed a lot of summer students over the years to do research. And we published a book called um, um, The Impact of, of Abortion on Women. Uh, complications, complications, colon, uh, abortions impact on women. And it has gone into two editions mm. and has had really quite a wide circulation. But this is not something I could ever discuss mm. in, in the university because it, it's, it's, um, it's a subject which um, simply cannot be discussed. Because mm. if you question abortion, you are anti-woman, you're a misogynist, mm. and you are benighted and ignorant and not uh, not worthy paying any attention to so i was now we can't even have um well we're having big discussions on the the groups that come and put up displays whether they should be allowed to or not uh, fortunately i think that has been in alberta anyway that was a very very famous a very oh, very important yes, decision yes. <clears throat> very important decision which defended the rights of the group yes. that wanted to to do that but there was there's a, there's a lot of attempts to stop that from, from oh, being, and, being and, and um, it's not as if there's total freedom because there are these student pro-life groups mm. in most universities, mm. but they are really hampered. Uh, for example, the student council in many places will say, well, uh, these, these groups uh, are so anti-woman that, um, we want, we don't want to recognize them. We don't want to give them a legit, legitimate status as a student group. We don't want to give them the right to reserve rooms for their meetings, for example. So they, they try and throw all kinds of roadblocks up in the way of any, any uh, pro-life student group. And these, of course, these pro-life student groups uh, can be very determined because they really believe strongly in what they stand for. Yeah. Nonetheless, the virtually every student council at, at virtually every university in the country is dominated by radical leftists, radical feminists. Postmodernists. 
<laughs> Postmodernists, if you, you like. I, I don't. I don't consider the the woke element to be uh, a left, left wing. wing. I don't. I don't see them as left wing. In fact, I see them as in, on many issues being further to the right than the classical would be considered to be the the kind of central liberal position. But leaving that aside, for uh, yeah. we get into the further discussions, what what is your view? What is your position on abortion? Oh, my position on abortion is that from the moment that that the male sperm fuses with the female ovum, you have a completely new, unique uh, entity that has its own DNA which will never be duplicated by any other entity. And if it is left alone and simply allowed to continue to grow inside its mother's womb, it will emerge within nine months as a fully formed human being. And if you think back to when, when did your life begin? Well, my life began when my mother's ovum was fused with my father's sperm. That's when my life began. That's when my unique identity originated. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my reasoning is that difficult though a pregnancy may be for many women for many reasons, they, you know, they're unemployed, they have no money, they're, they're only 16 years old, or, this, or they already have six children. You can think of any number of reasons why, why a pregnancy would, would be extremely difficult. Nonetheless, we're talking about a human life. Uh, which, interestingly, in tort law, in civil law, has been recognized. The unborn child, uh, and that's how it's referred to in tort law, mm. has the right to inherit, for example, if, a, if, a, if somebody leaves uh, a legacy to all his or her uh, living children, the courts have determined that living children, and, and let's say he dies, while his wife is pregnant, this man, and his wife subsequently gives birth to a child, that child is considered one of his living children, even though at the moment he died, it was a child in the womb. The other, the other important right that civil law, tort law, has recognized for the unborn is the right to sue after it's born, of course. You can't sue when you're in the womb. But if you're in an accident, a car accident, or in one famous case, a streetcar accident, um, a, a pregnant woman was, was in a streetcar accident and, and her unborn child was severely injured. Mm. And after birth, the child wa was uh, given the right, was had recognized as having the right to sue the people who were responsible for that accident, I don't know, the car that rammed the streetcar or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. for damages. So the child in the womb has the postpartum right to sue for damages inflicted, for, for injuries inflicted on it while it was in the womb. And of course, we all also know that uh, increasingly, the, the age of viability has gone down and down and down. It's now around 20 weeks after conception. And surgeons regularly perform medical operations on fetuses, on unborn children. They take, they open up the mother's womb, they take the, the child out, they perform the operation on the child, and then put it back in the womb. Mm. They are clearly dealing with a human being. Mm. So uh, I guess my position is, that, well, this is a human being and, and we ought to accord it uh, the rights of a human being. Mm. That's my, my, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple position, really. Yes. Uh, so uh, just so that I understand your position then, yeah. um, it, there's kind of two reasons why you who uh, perceive this as being a human being is yeah. one is kind of the biological kind of reason, which is it yeah. has the DNA. It has it. That's it's it's a completely different uh, entity mm -hmm. than before conception and at conception. That's when it gets its kind of essence, its biological essence as a human being. And yeah. then secondly, um, the the legal system in, in certain way, in certain 
uh, context yes. has seen it that way too, which kind of gives it kind of a precedent uh, type of forming uh, type of logic. To there's a there's a disjunction between the civil law and the criminal law. The criminal law says uh, um, um, an unborn child does not become a legal person until it emerges in a living state from mm. its mother's womb. That's mm. that is the position of the criminal law. Mm -hmm. The civil law uh, recognizes at least two crucial rights for an unborn child: the right to inherit and the right to sue. And and so why is there that difference? Do you think? <laughs> ask ask a lawyer the law is it because of the uh, the criminal law is more recent mm, no i i just think that the 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 criminal law has been the object of more attention from radical feminists mm. Uh, whereas the civil law has been the object of more attention from mothers who want to advance the cause of their their child or or a child him or herself after birth who says, hey, I was one of my father's living children, even though I was in the womb, so I deserve to inherit. So in other words, they have an interest, they have a voice, whereas um, the child uh, who is the object of abortion has no voice. Mm. And the criminal law says, you have the right to destroy that life anytime up to the day before it is born. That is the position of the Canadian law. Now, many other countries modify that, right? Canada is almost unique. I think it is unique in the world in having absolutely no law mm. on abortion, which mm -hmm. means that you can do it any time right up until a few minutes before it's born, mm. right up until it, it emerges from the birth canal, you yeah. can kill it. So, um, so do you think that um, any killing of humans, like, are you opposed to all killing of humans, like in, in, in any context, or is there certain circumstances where you see killing uh, of humans is acceptable? I think in self-defense. Uh, I th if, if somebody is is uh, attacking me and it looks as though they're trying to kill me, then I have the right to defend myself. If a mother, uh, if a mother's life really is at stake, in other words, if you carry on this pregnancy, you will die. Mm -hmm. Then that mother has a right to say, well, I, I don't think, you know, I don't want to die. Therefore, you sh you should terminate the life of my unborn child. And I think that I think the mother should have the legal right to say that, mm. uh, in other words, to defend her own life, mm. but not just to defend her health, not just to defend her economic well-being, not just to, you know, Morgan Toller did uh, an abortion on television, uh, a notorious abortion on television back in 1973, and he interviewed the woman he was about to perform the abortion on mm. and asked her, well, you know, why do you want the abortion? And she said... Well, my partner and I, I have, have, have planned a holiday in Mexico, and uh, <laughs> if I go through with this pregnancy, um, we won't be able to have the holiday in Mexico. And he said, okay, fine. And he went ahead and performed the abortion on television. Well, that wasn't a very good reason for terminating the life of your unborn child, just, just so that it wouldn't interfere with your holiday. Mm. Okay. Um, so... Uh, moving on to the third controversial uh, yeah. topic, you were not historically uh, uh -huh. involved in looking at the residential schools, so this is a relatively new. Kind That's of right. So what what made you interested in this in this controversy? First of all, I have to, I have to clarify that. Uh, Canadian history is not my area of expertise, although at the beginning of my professional career, when you know young assistant professors are often called upon to teach subjects they don't know a whole lot about. Mm. I was I was given the job of uh, conducting some tutorials in Canadian history and I gave a couple of lectures in Canadian history uh, to my for my colleague who wanted to be spelled off from time to time. So I, I do have experience in teaching Canadian history and I'm you know I've taken a number of courses in Canadian I, I, I 
I basically know my outline of Canadian history. And I also know a, a certain amount about our Indigenous people, you know, for things like having read Susanna Moody's Roughing It in the Bush. Mm. She has some very complimentary things to say about the Indigenous people that she met in the area near Rice Lake, where she and her husband lived back in the 1830s and 40s. And I've read books like The French Traveler by my friend Bill Gardner, which is a compilation of these, these um, travel narratives by, by people, um, overwhelmingly French speaking. And what, what time frame was that, uh, Ian? 18th like that century. Book? Yeah. 18th century? 18th century, and there are a lot of a lot of the book. Um, and in fact, I'll read you an excerpt if, if there's time. Mm. A lot of the book is is uh, simply impressions mm. of European French European travelers in North America, mostly present day Canada. Uh, their impressions of the native people and mm. you know what they're like, mm. and some of it's very uh, complimentary. Mm. And some of it is very blunt and not complimentary, <laughs> but it's it's balanced in my view. It's it's quite. We're only balanced. allowed to see the complimentary things. <laughs> yeah, and today, of course, we're only allowed to say the complimentary. You're gonna things. have to go through and, and pick out all the complimentary things and republish it with only the, the complimentary. <laughs> things. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this guy, for example, refers to them as sauvage. Oh yeah. Which is inaccurately translated as savages. Sauvage means basically wild. people who live in the wilderness and, yeah. and they're wild and they're not civilized, but it doesn't mean that they are savage. No, it well, doesn't mean that the at all. The thing about the term savage is that yeah. it, it, uh, it, it is a scientific term. Like, like the, yeah. Lewis Henry Morgan is the, the most, one of the most famous evolutionary anthropologists yeah. just used the term to refer to a particular stage of human oh, history. So right. basically it, it's a little bit more complicated than saying hunting and gathering, but uh, to some extent hunting and gathering and, and, and savagery, the state of savagery are, are the same. Although there can yeah. be cases like um, uh, the Northwest Coast Indians, which, which were, um, which, which, yeah, which had like a lot of surplus, relatively a lot, lot of surplus. So mm -hmm. they actually had technology, which was quite, uh, even a relative scale yes. sophisticated compared to others but but anyway but the point is is that people took those terms and then deployed them in a derogatory fashion later um, yeah. yeah yeah so it made it impossible like i i just saw negan sinclair in his latest uh, piece you know mm. accusing mm -hmm. me of you know referring to pre-contact hunters mm. and gatherers as being in the stage of savagery as if this was some kind of insulting kind of thing when it's just that's kind of the stage of history all humans were at when prehistory is a stage of prehistory uh, when you had basically a hunting and gathering mode of production hunting history, gathering nomadic certain right. kinds of technology uh, whereas the iroquois who were horticultural uh, mode of production uh, were referred to by morgan as the stage of barbarism like that was a stage oh, before right, barbarism <laughs> um, before iron age technology and all those sorts of developments but it was actually horticulture like yes. food, food production and so on but anyway so these terms are like it, it really has become impossible to use many of these terms because of the the yes. more recent it's, you know kind it's of, become you know, highly explosive yeah and of course Anybody who enters this arena is well advised not to use terms like savage and barbarism. But anyway, to why did I get in, involved? This was in, the, um, the, 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 um, the travel kind of narratives yeah. had sort of complimentary things that were said and had sort of somewhat uncomplimentary things that were said about. Do you want me to read you a, a, a paragraph from it? Sure. Uh, yeah. Which, which, Gives it's us an a, indication of the, an indication of, of the kind of thing. Read a compliment. <laughs> Only the compliment. No, no. Like read oh. whatever you what, read whatever you think is a representative. Okay, so this is this is um, a, a guy probably uh, Pierre Charlevoix. We think yeah. writing back to somebody in 
Paris uh, from, from North America. Admirable qualities of the Iroquois is the heading. Honor and shame are the main motives for all their actions. The former is their principal satisfaction, the latter their greatest punishment. Mm. The maturity of their counsels, their swiftness of execution, the good faith of their treaties, and faithfulness in their observance, a courage when tested, a dauntless valor, and heroic steadiness under torture, a steadiness of soul that adversity or prosperity never alters. Such are the good qualities of this barbaric people. And then he goes on. They are light-minded, lazy, ungrateful, suspicious, traitorous, vindictive, and all the more dangerous because of their ability to hide resentment and perfidy. This is a people that carries out unbelievable cruelties against its enemies. And in the inventiveness of torture surpasses the most awful inhumanities ever attempted by the worst tyrants of ancient history. But this does not apply only to the Iroquois. There is so little difference in the customs, morals, and the character of all these savages of North America that we can attribute to each of these particular nations what you have just been reading of one of them. So the Iroquois have many admirable qualities, but they also have some less than admirable qualities. That's what he's saying. And if you cannot, you, you cannot repeat that today. If I were a if I were a tenured professor at some Canadian university, I would be in deep trouble for having quoted this passage in yes. public. Yes. Well, deep in trouble. This, as in you the know, the original industry, uh, we did use, we did refer to the three stages that Morgan used, and that's yeah. was continued. Like that was kind of the biggest. It's it's kind of continued on to say, you know, you're yeah. obviously a racist if you're going to use those terms, which is totally untrue. It's not. It's not supposed to just apply to indigenous people. It's supposed to apply to all of humanity, and it it does have a a well thought out schema in terms of techno. It's doing it on a basis of technology. Um, yes. Um, but that's kind of the big issue. Um, is the developmental question, like whether, you know, cultural evolution mm -hmm. applies to this in terms of the differences that you see between uh, different indigenous groups, um, mm -hmm. but also between indigenous groups and the emerging nations, nation states that uh, in the European context. Um, but in terms of your uh, current interest in yeah. the in the residential yeah. schools, yeah. Um, wh why did you? Why is this something that is now kind of sparking your interest? Well, because you know the uh, there have been a lot of headlines about the residential schools, and this has been going on for a oh, quarter of a century. But it mm. it kind of reached a climax uh, mm. in 2021 mm. uh, with the um, allegation that there were 215 uh, unmarked or mass graves at the, the Kamloops uh, Indian Residential School, which just happens to be the biggest of all the residential schools. Yep. And that there were just horrific things that happened there. And of course, that was only one of, was it 113 schools in all? I, 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 I think it's 131, is that, that's the number that oh, is. Oh, right, 131. So there were a lot of them. Um, spread all across Canada and the Northwest Territories, mm -hmm. um, most of them in BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, and also Alberta, but also a lot in Ontario and Quebec and elsewhere. So, and apparently the, the narrative which kind of took hold and, and was accepted and promoted by the CBC and the Globe and Mail and the federal government and Trudeau in particular, was that these residential schools to which most Indian children were forced to go uh, were places of misery and abuse and starvation. And they were um, ill-clothed and simply downtrodden, forbidden to speak their own language mm -hmm. and, and treated uh, cruelly by their teachers. 
And this is why modern indigenous society has such problems, so much poverty, so much unemployment, so much drunkenness, so much spousal abuse, so much child abuse, and on and on and on, so much drug abuse. It's because they were victims of cultural, if not racial genocide mm. in, inflicted on them by these residential schools. And I thought to myself, gosh, that sounds very extreme. Can that really be totally true? And so I started to look into it. And the more I looked into it, the more I found that it was a gross travesty of the truth. But the truth didn't seem to matter to the people who were purveying this dominant narrative of exploitation and abuse and cruelty and genocide. Some people said cultural genocide. Other people said, no, out and out genocide. They were trying to wipe out the indigenous people. Yeah. It's clear that this is what the purpose of the residential schools was. And I, the more I read this, the more I thought, Really, all those people who volunteered at substandard wages to go uh, to these remote places in northern BC, northern Saskatchewan, northern Alberta, northern Manitoba, and and teach these children uh, English and arithmetic and other skills like skills like carpentry and sewing and so on and so forth. Were they really that cruel, that horrible? And so I, the more I looked into it, the more I, I came to the conclusion that this was a complete travesty of the truth. And I thought, well, look, I've established a good reputation as a professional historian. So I'm going to use my good reputation to try and draw attention to the other side of the story. Now, I haven't yet actually written something because I'm so impressed with the stuff that's already been written by you mm. and Rod Clifton and Nina Green and Jaime Rubenstein and all sorts of others, lots of people. Brian, I can't remember how to pronounce Giesbrick. his last name. Brian Giesbrick. Yes, yep. many people have written such good stuff that yep. What I, what I think I'm going to write on is the, the staff and the teachers at the schools, what they were like. Mm. And I'm also going to highlight all the positive comments. And there are many, many positive comments yeah. made by students who attended the residential schools. Mm. Everybody from Thompson Highway yeah. um, to, uh, what's his name, Francis Marchand, the first... Um, uh, ben, indigenous senator ben they all have yeah. very positive things to say about the residential school so i'm going to write something that highlights this and and of course is objective no doubt there were abuses no doubt oh yeah uh, and because there are always bad apples in any barrel and we know that child abuse takes place throughout our society in yeah. boy scout troops in hockey teams in uh in public schools um children are abused in the public schools but yeah. this is all sort of hush hushed and well, it's interesting because i'm um, talking to brian giesbrecht and and yeah. actually jacques Briard, who's another very very important figure in, in our group yeah. our research group tom flanagan is another person there's, there's yeah Ruyard and flanagan yes um, but Riard just provided us with a with a great um kind of summary of i believe it's celia haig brown's book uh, resistance yes. to renewal um and That's it was amazing how like the things and th i believe that was 86 when that book was published or something That's right and it was before the 1990s so there's a real yeah. shift that happened between the 80s and before and the 1990s where and later yeah you know the 80s it was kind of realized there were problems and everything and and, and so on and it was and and as well uh, you know neglect was a big feature and so on yeah. um but it wasn't the same kind of well in 19 i guess it's 2008 when, when albert howard and i were writing this robe in our original history i remember quite clearly because we were 
we were looking at the genocide claim yeah. and i remember we actually called it hysterical like we, we mm. thought it was hysterical and it must have been about 2005 that we were starting yeah. to look at it yeah. so it, it said at the time it seemed kind of out there like we realized there were serious problems with the residential schools but but to say it was genocide like first of all why would you have a school system at all like yeah. you're going to spend all this money and all this effort when you really just want to exterminate people like that's the doesn't seem to make any sense like now the, and then of course the cultural genocide which which was an attempt to kind of mm -hmm. like avoid that kind of idea that you're just trying to wipe people out you're trying to um you know eradicate the culture so that you can you know save the man kind of thing uh, you could argue but or it never really made sense. Yeah. but i think it was a uh, my own view was a, it was kind of a strategic maneuver to get people to accept the word genocide in a in a kind of a an orthodox kind of context and then once that had kind of entered into the the discourse then you just remove the word cultural and you know sort of thought no one would kind of notice that it, <laughs> that's sort of what that's sort of what happened a little bit i do you remember in 2019 yeah. There was a bit of pushback that was happening saying, no, we, we accepted cultural genocide and we can, you know, we understand what that means, but that's not the same as genocide. And then right. there was all sorts of, you know, kind of um, standoffs that happened about that. And then eventually it just got, now we're just at complete genocide to the point where you must be very interested. The Canadian Historical Association yeah. says that there's consensus about right. it. Right, which is absurd. So, like... I don't know, like this is kind of was a bit forced, uh, you know, like it was forced. And furthermore, it devalues the real genocides that have happened, mm. like the, the Holocaust against the Jews, mm. like the destruction of the Cambodian people, you yeah. know, 15 percent of their population being wiped out or or Rwanda, in, in Rwanda, yeah. where almost a million people were wiped out. That's that's genocide. Yeah, but the Indian population from you know the Indian population was undergoing steady decline until about 1950, if I'm yeah. if I'm correct. Yeah. After which point it has steadily increased, and in fact it's growing much faster than the Canadian population. So there's there's certainly no genocide going on. Hasn't been for a long time, if if ever. And what are they talking about? Yeah, what well, that's you can't even about? really get because it's sort of like it's settled. It's a matter that's settled, and and that's kind of what I found is that when I was at Mount Royal trying to yeah. battling this out in the trenches, I was saying I was trying to stop people from just having university wide declarations of it because I thought that yeah. was going to be a real difficulty for for people yes. who wanted to criti you know, yes. provide a critical <laughs> viewpoint, which that was completely correct because all the students and so on thought that was, you know, you were going against the, the, the dictates of the school to make your, put forward your critical position. Um, but, but why do you think that there's been this huge change between the eighties, what, what existed the eighties where there was kind of a recognition of problems, but it was sort of understood that it was, the intent was to enable indigenous people to be, assimilated into the kind of the, the dominant economy and society to the 1990s where there just started to be this turn to say it was just completely horrible and there was just these massive atrocities that were happening. Oh boy. Well, I think it's part of a an overall program and it's not necessarily conscious on the part of everyone who participates in it but it's an overall program really to undermine the foundations of our existing civilization and to call everything into question and say that everything is corrupt uh, everything is based on exploitation there uh, everything is is based on racism and all the so-called heroes of the past, people like Sir John A. Macdonald, people like Edgerton Ryerson, all these people that we thought were wonderful, they weren't, they were agents of racism, agents of exploitation. And in fact, our whole civilization has been one based on racism, slavery, 
exploitation, persecution of the poor, and we have to wipe the slate clean and get rid of all the people who held power in the past and replace them with a new class. And part of this new class will be the indigenous people. So we are basically handing power over to the indigenous people because we white people have proven ourselves unworthy to exercise power because we're we are racists we are exploiters we are anti-woman we are we are just everything terrible mm. Mm. so I, it's part of the i think it's part of the general attack on our on our modern western society which many people think and it's especially in the university many people think yeah yeah that's right now i don't think the Canadian people as a whole, I don't think the American people as a whole accept this story that mm -hmm. we're all racists and exploiters, but the people who seem to wield a, a lot of power in our society mm -hmm. have bought this, like many business leaders mm -hmm. say, oh yes, 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 we're, we, for example, we, we have done such terrible damage to the, to the environment. And, and so we must, we must abolish fossil fuels. We simply have to get rid of fossil fuels. Climate change is such a terrible, we are gonna be destroyed by climate change if we don't radically change everything in the next 20 years. Climate change is gonna destroy the whole planet. Mm -hmm. And so people have this sense of panic and this sense of, oh, you know, everything we've done in the past is wrong. And so <laughs> we have to, step aside and let a new class of people take over. Yeah. Well, Ian, it's, uh, I know it's hard to believe, but an hour has taken place. Yes. So um, <laughs> we've covered a lot of interesting terrain. Uh, yes. And now it's your turn to cover things that you don't think we got into enough detail on or uh, look at some Interrogate new Interrogate you. Whatever, whatever <laughs> you want to. Whatever you want to know, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm open to it. Well, um, Francis, I, I must say that I've uh, admired you for quite a while. Um, first of all, because of your writings in in this book, and I'm I'm going to highlight this book because I think it's a very worthy book. From oh, yes. Truth Comes Reconciliation, edited by edited by uh, Rod Clifton, and is it Mark? Yep, Mark DeWolf. Mark DeWolf, yes. Uh, and you have two excellent essays in, in that book. Yep. And what, uh, what sort of shocked me and horrified me was that for writing what you thought was the truth about residential schools and um, indigenous issues in general, uh, various people at your university, Mount Royal in Calgary, ganged up on you. And even though you had a tenured position as an associate professor in political science, correct? Yeah, you well, were yeah. Well, dismissed. Yeah. You were dismissed, fired. Yeah. Um, fired for expressing politically unacceptable views. So the university is supposed to be a place where people can pursue their interests, pursue the truth, publish what they find without fear of um, being persecuted. Mm. As, as Voltaire, the, the guiding principle is supposed to be Voltaire. Remember Voltaire back in the 18th century mm. said, I may disagree with you profoundly, but I will fight to the death <laughs> for your right to say it. Yes. To yeah. say what you will, I will fight to that. And, and I had a, a good friend, Bill Irvine, who that was his guiding principle. He said, mm. I, you know, yeah. I'm left wing, I'm left wing, but yeah. I will fight to the death for the right of any conservative to express his opinion or her opinion, because I follow Voltaire on this. I thought the modern university followed Voltaire on this, but mm. as we now know, that is the farthest thing from the truth. So can you just explain to me how this happened to you 
Yeah, so it, it probably needs a little bit of explanation because it, 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 it was not just, I was writing my articles and everything and then people went after me and then Mount Royal fired me. Um, what happened is that there was a general kind of climate that was becoming more and more hostile towards, mm. um, you know, discussing, and it wasn't just indigenous issues. It was um, also trans activism was a big one oh, as well, yeah. Um, yeah. which I, I wasn't really involved with, except I thought you should be able to discuss yeah. at a university whether or not trans activism negatively impacts women's rights. That was the question. And there was yeah. a huge kind of, um, you know, response to that and, you know, claims that um, we were denying the humanity of trans people and like this kind of catastrophic kind of language. And, mm. you know, I was dealing with a lot of, um, on social media, a lot of my colleagues defaming me constantly and calling me a racist and so on. And uh, I was pretty, I wasn't happy about this because I realized it was going to be used as a a way to delegitimize my position, but I put mm. up with it because I was a free speech advocate. And I said, mm. well, that's kind of the price you pay is if you want people to speak their minds, then, you know, and it's kind of, you know, coming up against defamation a little bit, it's true, but I don't want to be discouraging people from saying what they think is true. I think we should just battle it out in terms of- yeah discussions and so on um but then with the george floyd killing in 2020 mm -hmm. the university started to be like the, the 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 whole what's called wokeism which is um identity politics which has become totalitarian uh mm -hmm. it's kind of kind of a postmodern kind of comes out of postmodernism things became much more uh uh, this kind of became much more aggressive and assertive that you had to have the right kind of position mm -hmm. and a group of uh, this kind of anonymous student group formed and wanted um, mandatory anti-racism training brought in to the university oh, yeah. <laughs> and my colleague Sinclair McRae who's a philosopher who's a very calm rational person who is never never as an unkind word to say about anyone, wrote this really good response to these efforts to bring in these initiatives. And he was just completely ignored. Uh, and so I thought, mm. well, I, I, what, I, what I decided to do was to, to, to uh, try a satirical approach to mm. start bring in some satire to it. And that led me to write a satirical letter and post it on my Facebook account. Um, not just addressed generally to all the people who had signed this letter saying mm. that George Orwell had come to me in a dream and he had told <laughs> me that, um, you know, his critique of totalitarianism was misguided and he'd now known that, you know, intersectional postmodernism was the way to go and, and so <laughs> on. And, and, uh, and so I, as part of this, I developed this oppression, what I called the oppression point system where mm. you would get one oppression point if you're a male and one if you're white and one if you're cisgendered, et cetera. And uh, I assigned points to all the people who had signed the letter, but I, I blacked out their names so that you didn't know who the individuals were, but it was, you know, just sort of saying, hey, yeah. Yeah. you guys yeah. should resign if you're, if you're really on board with this, all this intersectionality stuff, it's time, you, you're all privileged, relatively speaking, compared to, you mm. know, the, people at the bottom of the heap and so you should resign and give up your positions for the BIPOC uh, scholars so that we can increase anyway that kind of got everyone sort of a bit primed to not like me very much about that and then humor can be very dangerous yeah, so people humor, so was, people resent humor when it's directed against <laughs> themselves so I was kind of experimenting with this and then the Wendy Mesley case broke uh, which was Wendy Mesley, very, very uh, well-known journalist at CBC, um, had referred to the book title by Pierre Valliere's White Niggers of America. And, uh, mm. and also, <gasps> you know, and so everyone, and so she got basically, she wasn't fired, but her career was ended because of the situation. And I could not believe that <clears throat> this happened. And so I started to rail on this like saying this is ridiculous and it's a completely different thing to you know quote a word or mention a word or 
have a title versus calling someone a racial slur. That's a completely different thing. Anyway, yeah. so this, this troll who had been kind of, you know, flying around a bit, uh, who I didn't know, it, it turned out to be a student, but they weren't identified as a student, uh, set me up. And I knew they were setting me up, um, said, you know, if the word is so benign, why don't you use it yourself? Because I was intentionally avoiding right. using this word. And so then at that point, I thought, well, Wendy Mesley didn't do anything wrong. So if I'm going to support Wendy Mesley's doing that, I'm going to do the same thing that she has done. So I, I mentioned the word and referred to the word in this post. And that led to a situation where about 40 faculty members were like a mob began to form and this anonymous student group was agitating to get me fired and so on. And I couldn't, I just couldn't take it seriously. Like I thought it was so ridiculous. And mm. I, I tried to argue with people and say, what are you talking about? And then they would just keep on saying, you're a racist. You're a racist mm. for, for using that word, you're a racist. And so I just at that point decided to turn my Twitter account into a satirical character modeled on France, on uh, Titania McGrath, which is, which is Andrew Doyle's character. Um, mm. And I, uh, I would, sat every time they tried to, you know, agitate to get me fired, I, I would, uh, I would satirize it and use their words. Like they'd use, call me a epistemic terrorist and a hateful Epistemic. harasser and a white supremacist. <laughs> and I just say, you know, that Francis Whittleson, she's a hateful harasser and this and that. And I was, I was, and I was congratulating them on their, yeah. on their uh, attempts to get me fired. And this then resulted in me being charged with harassment. For harassment. Them. Yeah. So because I got, you made fun of them. Yeah, I was, I was kind of uh, satirizing their attempts to uh, do anyway, but but it was my impression because I've been defamed for several years on social media that Mount Royal and I've been letting Mount Royal know about it, like saying, hey, you know, just so you know, uh, this is kind of yeah. what your policies are doing. Like you're 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 opening me up for this kind of situation, you know, and you should be aware of it. I I wasn't trying to get anyone punished, but I was just telling them about it, and because they didn't do anything about it, hmm. I assumed that they didn't see social media as a as a workplace issue. So I was really shocked when I got these harassment complaints because I was basing my activities on the, what how I had been treated for the last three years. Yeah. And I thought once I showed would show Mount Royal all this documentation and say, hey, you know, this is why, then they would go, well, that's true. And, you know, we've got to do a social media policy so people understand what the expectations are and so on. But they didn't care at all. They just pursued mm -hmm. me. And it was pretty obvious, you know, after about a year and a half or no, it was a year and a month, I guess, of going through all these sort of star chamber kinds of processes that, um, they were just trying to catch me in a net and 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 get rid of me like they were trying to get rid of me and they they were using these processes to do it i find it interesting that what you were doing was basically outside the academy it was basically extracurricular yep. it, it wasn't anything you said in the classroom nope. it wasn't uh, a seminar a lecture nope. it wasn't anything that you did uh, in your actual job as an associate professor it yeah. was what you did basically in your spare time if you like yeah well that's what and, i thought uh, and but now they're saying and this is what this all the arbitration is going to be about is is it's going to be determined you know we don't know we have no we have we're no closer to knowing what the whole standards are now than we were in november and 2020 when everything started the funny thing is, though, is that um, in 2019, one of my colleagues was saying to me that I, because he he knew he he knew the he saw the writing on the wall and he thought it was highly likely I was going to be set up in various mm -hmm. ways, and he said to me, "Whenever you say anything publicly, make sure you record it mm -hmm. because you're going to get nailed on something you say, and they're going to." They'll distort it, and you know, so I, I was kind of going, nah, that's not going to happen. It's going to be fine. But I, he did convince me to do this. Um, and 2019 September, 
I started to record everything that I had said yeah. Yeah. publicly. And uh, one of the thing, and a lot of the complaints have been about things that I said, but I fortunately had recordings to fight back against the workplace stuff. Yeah. But the funny thing is, is that um, Mount Royal has added in um, a, a circumstance, which was a arts faculty council meeting in um, March, 2021, which they say that I disrupted so much that mm. um, they had to disable the chat function because of my, you know, I was out of control in this meeting. Anyway, I recorded everything in that meeting and it was completely made, they completely made this up. And it was actually seven other faculty members who attacked me in this mm. meeting. So they were out of control. Yeah, they were out, they were completely out of control. Um, but it's kind of interesting. And you were the victim. Yeah, I was, I was a victim. I was just asking a question about how um, someone was saying that indigenous scholars didn't feel safe mm. at Mount Royal. And I, I was going, okay, well, what, what sorts of things are making them feel unsafe? For example, um, I had a chapter, uh, Massimo Piliucci is a famous skeptic, had a chapter in my Indigenizing the University edited volume. And mm -hmm. he, he was talking about how there's no such thing as Indigenous science. There's science and there's not science. And as soon as you put an ethnic adjective, then you're, you're dealing with kind of pseudoscientific kind of stuff. And anyway, so I was just mentioning that this was like, is this the kind of thing that the Indigenous scholars feel unsafe about? And that led to all these seven faculty members kind of going crazy and attacking me for asking this question. Um, but that's all recorded. So I, I don't like for Mount Royal to have added that in there. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, like they're, they're obviously trying to get a workplace thing put in there. So they're a little bit nervous that the social media stuff is not going to fly because they don't yeah. think they're going to be able to get a workplace kind of thing on there. So now they've added in this meeting um, that is not substantiated in any and way. You supposedly disrupted. Yes. But and you have the record me. which shows that you were not disrupting it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's astonishing. Work. I'm reminded of Ray, uh, Dinesh D'Souza. He's a famous American public commentator who at one point a few years ago said the modern university has become an island of tyranny and oppression <laughs> uh, set in the midst of a sea of freedom. Now you may question how much the rest of the society is a sea of freedom, but yeah. I think his point, his very penetrating yeah. point was that the university has become a, a place of intolerance and yeah. oppression and, and tyranny, yeah. intellectual tyranny. Yeah, no, you would, true. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's, um, you know, and actually until 2020, I yeah. would have probably disagreed with that. Cause I, I, you know, I started at Mount Royal in 2008 and I, and I always spoke my mind Mm. Uh, you know, I always was a little bit, I could feel that people didn't like it. And, uh, you know, I wasn't popular amongst certain people at the university, but I really didn't care. Um, because I had lots of people that I knew, like, you know, I knew that it was not personal against me. I knew it was about the ideas that people didn't like. And I saw it as my duty to, yeah. um, you know, to put forth ideas that I thought was that were true, regardless yeah. of whatever kind of response. And since I had been involved in these kinds of, you know, critical discussions since I guess uh, 1994, starting with the traditional knowledge, kind of the criticism of traditional knowledge in the Northwest Territories, I was, I was used to these kinds of attacks. So it wasn't like it was a, you know, I know people who are just really surprised when all of a sudden all these people turn on them and start, you know, calling them a terrible person and things like this, but I was kind of used to that. So that didn't bother me very much. Mm. Uh, and I was, and I felt quite confident that Mount Royal was going to stand behind me. Like I, I really did up until the very end, you know, Yeah. <laughs> but you know, they're not going to fire me. Like, <laughs> they, 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 they have to see, like they have to see that this was totally unjust and it was me who was being attacked so 
I was being attacked um, starting in, I guess, July when the Wendy Mesley thing all broke, um, you know, starting then. And I was just defending myself. I wasn't going out after people or anything. I was just completely reacting to what people were doing. And still, you know, Mount Royal just decided, well, they, that was it. <laughs> How can they, they defend up? that action when you are a, a, a tenured faculty member? Well, they say Mount Royal is a strong supporter of academic freedom and freedom of expression, but our employees are entitled to work in a workplace that is free from discrimination and harassment. So how were you discriminating or harassing people? Um, well, the- According the to them. Uh, so just to give you an example, so this is the most bizarre one, which is, yeah. uh, and it's actually not indigenization, it's trans activism. So uh, Jonathan, there was this white supremacy culture workshop. Mm. <laughs> that was gonna be held by the faculty association. Mm. And uh, Jonathan Kay somehow got his hands on the email that was sent out by the faculty association to about a hundred people mm -hmm. announcing this workshop. Um, and it wasn't me who sent him the email, even though people claimed that it was me. It was not me. Um, not that it would matter anyway, since it went out to a hundred people and it was faculty association. So mm. it's like holding to them a, to account. Anyway, so Jonathan Kay got his hands on this and thought it was hilarious, of course, which it was mm. because here's the, you know, faculty association admitting that we have kind of this white supremacist institution or whatever. And so he did this slightly mocking uh, chain of tweets and and found out that the person that was going to be um in charge of the workshop also did pronouns workshops oh pronouns and said that this person could do did, you know was a they them mm. and could do double the indoctrination by having not only the white supremacy thing but also the the gender breading you know, whatever. So yeah. anyway, so I did this kind of riff off of Jonathan Kay's emails, my satirical character. Mm. And I told Jonathan Kay, oh, oh no, there's a, a another guy who who was a professor at Mount Royal properly, but he was a he, he didn't he didn't have his name. He was a anonymous that kind of <laughs> figure. Um, said, you know, how did Jonathan Kay get his hands on this email? Uh and so then I responded to this guy whose name was Dr. Tony saying, I don't know why Dr. Tony is so upset with Jonathan Kay. Uh, Jonathan Kay, the, 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 this, MRU, an M, this MRU colleague, the one who's doing the pronouns workshop, I didn't mention mm -hmm. the person by name, um, is, you know, is perhaps suffering from misgendering fatigue because <laughs> there was this cartoon Mm. in the pronouns workshop about misgendering fatigue, um, which was about this person who had a, a backpack on. And they mm. said every time they were misgendered, it was like someone was putting a brick in their backpack. Uh. To the point where at the end of the day, their backpack was full of bricks. So they had to lie down because they mm. were so exhausted that they could get up. Anyway, it was quite funny, the cartoon was, because it was mm. like, it's kind of catastrophic kind of thinking. So I said, uh, this MRU colleague, uh, because this Dr. Tony guy had said MRU colleague, so I was just repeating his language, appears to be, you know, could potentially be suffering from misgendering fatigue. Um, Jonathan Kay is just amplifying a TGBQ2S LMNOP voice. <laughs> LMNOP. And I was satirizing the misgendering fatigue kind yeah. of thing has been catastrophic. And also all the letters, you know, this ridiculous use of letters. Anyway, that one tweet was found to have violated three policies and two laws. Three policies of the university? No. And two laws of the country? Of Alberta. Of Alberta. Our Occupational Health and Safety Act and Human Rights Act. Because it was mocking 
um, a trans person's identity. Oh. Anyway, but I wasn't mocking the trans person's identity. I was mocking the misgendering fatigue idea and the letters, like uh, like the, the fact that they keep on expanding all these letters. LGBTQ, uh, LMNOP, you mean? But you know, like a lot of a lot of LGBT people mock this ridiculous letters, expanding letters all over the place and misgendering fatigue. You know, I'm sure a lot of trans people think this, you know, this kind of obsession with misgendering and so on and being so catastrophic about it is yeah. like, so I don't even think anyway, so that, that, that just gives you a sense of, you know, for me, what the standard was, uh, you know, as to what I, you know, and, and I would never, you know, like, <coughs> I, like, I just think I don't even know how to, if that's going to be how people are going to react to what I saw as being a, a very mild kind of, you know, satirical <laughs> response to this ridiculous cartoon and, and this nonsensical initialism that's getting thrown So it was out. less what you were saying about Indigenous issues and more about um, gender issues. It, it was well, the that gender was the one, issue. So that was one. <laughs> that was that the was, first one. And then there was all the... Um, the second one was that this Indigenous scholar <laughs> who was angry at me for my views and, and actually you know, was was complained about the questions that I would ask and so on. Um, yeah. But she went after me. She was the one who went after me for the Wendy Mesley, uh, defending Wendy Mesley. And so she was like at the at the at the forefront of trying to get me fired. So yeah. she was actively agitating all this these anonymous student groups. So I was responding to her trying to get yeah. me fired, and then that was found to be uh, harassment. And then the third harassment one, of her by you. Yes. So I was found to harass her by trying to defend myself against her trying to get me fired. Yeah. Um, which I thought was totally. And when I was saying to people, look, you know, you realize that my the, the satire was in response to her trying to get me fired. Mm -hmm. said, well, we're investigating you. We're not investigating her. So it's like this. So it Even like, though she was trying to get you fired. And then the last one was a, just completely. Uh, and this is public. Uh, Renee Watchman is the Indigenous scholar who went off to McMaster. She wrote this kind of six page, it was actually a um, 25 page complaint, but a lot of it was attachments. But six pages of things like I didn't capitalize I in Indigenous, and oh. I had diversity, inclusion, and equity as an acronym for. Uh, uh, die is the acronym for diversity, inclusion, and equity. That I gave conference presentations that she thought were offensive. That I, you know, all sorts <laughs> of just mm. anyway crazy kinds of accusations. Which at the time, I was trying to get Mount Royal to justify why they were taking this complaint forward. So I was saying, could you please tell me what parts of this complaint you mm. think, if true? would rise to the level of harassment and they mm -hmm. never would respond and do anything like that. So I got dragged into this. So um, they never responded. No. It seems to me that if, if you uh, committed any error, uh, it was in using humor against your critics. Yes. Perhaps if you hadn't used humor so much, they wouldn't have reacted with such fury. Well, definitely, uh, you know, at the time, I, I was so, this is, when I was started doing it, I thought, because I was identifying the mob, so I was yeah. really happy at the beginning, because I was thinking, I finally know who these people are, because I, yeah. for a while there, it was all in the shadows, and I didn't know who was responsible for all these kinds of things that were going on, and then in uh, July, everyone came out of the woodwork, and so I was yeah. able to, I was able to actually map this mob, yes. and I was documenting all of the activity, and what I would do is I would take screen captures of all of their activity and circle their names mm. and then repost it with a satirical commentary about them. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought at the time, because I was identifying them and broadcasting who they were, that they would back off. Because that they'd they be embarrassed. Be, that they'd be embarrassed, but they just became more and more emboldened because they were oh. all acting together as a, as a kind of a group. 
all supporting one another. So, um, but I was well, perfectly happy to continue, you know, this kind of thing. And actually it did after a while die down because everyone realized that I wasn't going to, I was just going to keep on satirizing everything that they did. So um, it was, but still, and I, and then Mount Royal told me that I, I couldn't direct any of my satire at the, um, any member of the MRU community. So I stopped doing that. Like I stopped directing things at people because. What's the, sorry, what's the MRU community? Any member of the MRU community. So another professor or a student or a staff member. Oh, oh, I see. Mount Royal University community. Right, yeah. right. Like they were right. saying your satire is okay. Well, no, well, they didn't like it, obviously, but they were saying it's not harassment if you don't, if you don't direct it at any member of the MRU community, but it is harassment if you do. So I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to, I won't direct it at any member of the MRU community anymore. But then in the last complaint, they found me to be a harasser, even when I hadn't directed things. For example, that satirical letter that I mentioned. Yes. Was found to be harassing. Even though you didn't mention faculty colleagues. Yeah. Or, or students for that because matter. they felt the, the investigator said um other faculty members could think that i was demeaning their viewpoint demeaning their viewpoint and tough, i thought tough, tough. i didn't think the meaning i didn't think i thought like if, if we we're going to go by demeaning viewpoints as being the standard my viewpoint <laughs> is being demeaned constantly so yeah I don't so anyway one thing so now with it going to arbitration this is all going to be sorted out by the arbiter who is going to have to you know look at these things and 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 the thing that is important is because the standard is obviously applied so differently to me as yes. everyone else if the legal system yes. is intact which is a big if it should be found to be you know completely without merit uh because i was never given any kind of you know I, I was never given any guidance by mount royal as to how i should be behaving and based upon how everyone else was behaving you know i can be forgiven for not really understanding what the kinds yes. of rules were about all of this well yeah yeah your position is extremely rational and and i think justified uh but bearing in mind that your foes, which in this case is the university, have much deeper pockets than you do. Yeah. How are you going to stand up to the fact that they can probably keep on hiring lawyers for as long as it takes to face you down, whereas you could run out of money? I mean, you're just one individual who no longer has a job. How yep. can you possibly face the combined power of the university and its lawyers how can you face up how can you face that well i've got a crowdfunding uh, uh thing that's uh that people can contribute to so it's going to be stages so right now okay. it's just fighting the the um fighting the battle in january so it's kind of one step at a time so the hope is is that it will be public in mm -hmm. January, the, that the that the hearing that the uh, arbitration hearing will be public, so that people yep. can uh, all these documents, people can look at all these documents, um, and so I raised almost twenty five thousand dollars now through the crowdfunding, uh, which I'm going to use to um, have a lawyer, have a lawyer who's an expert in freedom of expression, yeah, um, and then I have a research assistant who's a very very uh, competent academic in her own right. Uh, excellent thinker who has a background in um you know sort of faculty associations and uh, administrative law that's another mm. big kind of area and um you know kind of academic freedom and freedom of expression kinds of things and get her to write up briefs on yeah. various subjects which then can be shared that's the yeah. thing is that i would like to make all this available to all professors everywhere so that they can sort of see the kind of thing. And, and we've, I've already been in, in you know, interactions with many professors who are facing, some, not, not as severe, but the initial stages of these kinds of things. Yes. Yes. And, and, and basically when it started to happen, 
you start to get investigated for things, yeah, that means that they're 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 singling you out and in your days are numbered unless you can get serious procedural weight behind you and fight back against it. Um, so that's kind of the right now it's the planning stages for January as well. Um, the Canadian Association of University Teachers has taken over the the legal case. So they're they're the lawyers now for are the they? faculty association. And they are backing you. Yeah, so they're the lawyers. So what happened is I have my own faculty association, um, which has has been good in some ways, like they have taken forward my grievances to arbitration. Um, but it's mm. it's been captured by wokeism as well. They made things very, very difficult in other ways for me. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, CAUT recognizes that it is a national case, mm -hmm. which has implications. Basically, it means if this, if I lose my case, that any professor who says something that their colleagues don't like on Twitter or yeah. social media, they could be fired. Like, like yeah. that's that's kind of the thing. So, like, if that's going to be the case, that means almost any professor who's on social media, that, that's like, it's, it's, it's this unknown kind of thing where the employer can just move in there and claim that somehow you're ruining the reputation of the university or um, all these kinds of claims, which, you know, we all kind of knew this was a problem, this kind of language, because, mm -hmm. you know, my work on the residential schools, many people say, is harmful to the reputation of the university. When that's just their own kind of interpretation, my view is, is that it harms Mount Royal's reputation for them to be taking on political kinds of causes because yeah. now they have clamped down on the pursuit of truth and open inquiry, which is what an academic university is supposed to be about. So there's a lot of kind of corporatization and managerialism happening that is very destructive to the academic mandate of the university and i'm hoping that with my case that can be exposed a bit mm -hmm. you know we can start to see you know universities kind of engaged in this branding exercise where they want to make it seem like that they have this kind of social justice ethos this is not good for uh disputation what's what's known as disputation so yeah. that's that's so so that's all it, it's kind of right now the next six months is preparing for the case in january once um the 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 uh, i should be reinstated mm -hmm. but that's what mount royal should that should happen because i was fired for completely you know absurd reasons so yeah. but but you know it's like the arbiter sometimes says that he thinks that the relation, the employment relationship is not viable anymore. And so that they won't do that. But it's not like there's nothing. I have no problem being at Mount Royal. Like I thought Mount Royal in 2008 was a great institution. And it was really only in 2020 that things started to fall apart. If we could just restore some of the, the academic scaffolding that we used to yeah. have then there's going to be no problem and and telling indigenous scholars things like you know Frances Widowson has a right to criticize your perspective like that's part of her academic freedom yes and, scholars and, in the same area have the right to criticize each other's but, views especially if they base it on evidence the way the articles that i've read by you do yes base the arguments on evidence. Yep. seems to me that if you don't win this case, then a deep chill is going to uh, set in on universities all across Canada and, and no faculty member who values their job will dare to step out of line and make statements that displease the woke establishment and the woke establishment seems to have an iron grip on the university these days. And so it's not just about indigenous affairs, important though that is, it's about the whole gender issue. It's about the whole climate issue. 
It's about the COVID issue. If you dare to step out of line and yeah. criticize official policies on COVID, you could be in trouble. Vaccines, for example, questioning whether lockdowns were on balance, good or bad, things like that, which even now there's, there's a, a deep chill and people are looking over their shoulder and saying, Ooh, if I, you know, if I say something negative about, about the government's COVID policies, yeah. am I going to be in trouble? Yeah. You know, um, and that's, that's really, it's, you know, the university and, and that's why tenure is so important. People often sort of see tenure as this kind of perk that, you know, yes. a bunch of eggheads and privileged yes. academics have, but, but really, if you don't have tenure, you, you, you won't, you won't have all that, you know, the controversial ideas that, that people felt protected when they were talking about, that's going to become much, much more difficult. And people really, you know, and, and, you know, like, as I said, I really didn't, I, I knew things were not heading in the right direction, but I, I really thought, Mount Royal was not going to fire me for well, like it's, things started to become like when I had these discussions with the administration about it, mm -hmm. they, they just wouldn't they just wouldn't um, discuss anything. Like they had this very autocratic kind of way of dealing with me, and I was and that's why I was thinking, hmm, you know. And people were saying, well, they're signaling to you if if you don't accept responsibility and show remorse uh -huh. they're gonna fire you they're giving you you know they're they're trying to get you to submit and you're not doing it so like they're they're ratcheting up their efforts um but it, it really was quite recent that i started to you know actually say hey you know i could be out of here like i i did i really didn't think that was going to happen and i and i sort of thought you know, fairness would prevail. Like I always had this kind of feeling that if I just argued the hmm. case well enough with Cogently. evidence, you know, people, reasonable people would listen and, and would respond in kind when it seemed pretty much the die was cast, you know, like, like, like it, like, like it just was Francis Witteson's wrong. We want to bring in these indigenous scholars they don't want their views to be questioned. They see that as being unsafe. Francis Widdowson's never going to stop doing that. Therefore, we got to get rid of Francis Widdowson. Like that seemed to me to be what was happening. To make the environment safe for for the other scholars who don't agree with her. Yeah, like you know, safety. Like this is really, you know, like, like it's very odd to to hear language like that. You know what? Your your case actually reminds me of a, of a case involving the late Frank Scott at the end of the 1930s, and he he was very closely connected with the CCF, which is the mm. predecessor of the present day NDP. He was, uh, I think, the head of or one of the leading members of the the League for Social Reconstruction. Mm. So he was a radical socialist, mm. and he was not afraid to express his views. And the people at the universities at the time found his views very offensive. And they decided that they were going to get rid of Frank Scott. He had no business being in the university. No. Uh, and he fought back hard and he managed to mobilize enough support that he escaped dismissal, I would say, by the skin of his teeth. He almost got fired. Mm. And so this was an important victory for academic freedom, and it was remembered as such for, for many years later. But now the shoe is on the other foot, and the, the woke people are in charge, and anybody whose views seem to smack in any way of conservatism, and I know you don't like that label, mm. uh, because you don't think of yourself as a conservative, and, and I'm sure you're not really, but you have been thrown into that camp mm. and the, the people who detest conservatism in whatever form want to purge the university of anybody who does not hold woke views on every issue, whether it's 
Aboriginal issues, whether it's gender issues, whether it's climate issues, whether it's COVID issues, whether it's abortion, whatever it is, whether it's euthanasia, any issues where people challenge the dominant narrative, they're in trouble. And if you lose your case, then we're all in deep trouble, those of us yeah. who still have. And it, it strikes me as very ironic that the people who, oh, the only people who seem to feel that they can speak freely these days, um, certainly in the academy, are people who are retired and cannot be fired. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, well, the woke, uh, this kind of totalitarianism, this creeping totalitarianism, yes. Um, you know, it's very alarming. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that people are not more, uh, you know, aware of it and concerned about it. And it's not just um, the university. It, it's sort of, you can sort of feel it in the wider society that you're, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's all the social media companies and everything. Like, like you get surveilled, like you're being surveilled for what you put on there and you, then you, you lose your account or this sort of thing is happening to all sorts of people. Now you yeah. say, well, what, what's the big deal about that? You know, like that's just a, you can go somewhere else and express yourself and whatever, but it, it just kind of is a, it's indicative of, of the kind of mentality, yes. which is we don't really want to have the discussions anymore. Like no. that's kind of the problem. And we need to discuss these things. Like we, we have a lot of, areas that are unclear and we we can't even really determine at this stage what the points of disagreement are about things like no. that brief discussion that you and i had about abortion there um i'm I, although i don't completely understand the position and i have to kind of filter it and figure out how that relates to mine i, yeah. I at least kind of have a starting point into it to try to figure out okay well you know, where is our kind of commonality and where's our differences, but, but that's not happening anymore. No. And um, you notice this, and you will notice this too, when you get into the, the residential schools and the, yes. you know, we, we've seen this um, uh, over the last couple of weeks, just, um, you know, become a blow up where we actually had two articles, uh, one by Terry Glove, Glavin in the National Post, another one by Dana Kennedy in the um, in the New York Post. That was the first yes. mainstream media coverage with yeah. the opposite. Everything else up until then had been either in a kind of a what would be considered to be a fringe media outlet or um, uh, the would be the dominant kind of viewpoint in the CBC and all that kind of stuff. But these two pieces was the first time in a year where yeah. there'd been any kind of different perspective put forward. And there was like, it was like the reaction was quite extraordinary. Of An just- explosion. Of, of, and, and they won't, they don't engage at all with the argument. <laughs> no, they say, what right does he have to express such poisonous views? And in the case of Glavin, who actually is is much more um, conciliatory to the yes. indigenous kind of leadership position than I would argue is warranted, yep. there was an attempt to even stop him from appearing on a on a talk show uh, because really? it was felt that even and the the interview was going to be very antagonistic towards him as well. It wasn't going to be a friendly interview. It was going right. to be. It was going to be an unfriendly interview, but people were saying just to have him on that program is giving him airtime and uh, Glavin, giving Glavin airtime and is going to be further re-traumatizing oh, yes. survivors and all this kind of stuff when it hasn't even been established that there's any remains there anyway. So how, like, there's been this kind of buildup of uh, of you've got to accept it. This is the position. If you don't, you're going to be labeled denialist, Holocaust denier, all these kinds of things. And they they don't want to sort it out as to what is just mm. seen as beyond the pale. And, and it's not going to be, we're not going to get into it. It's just going to be, uh, it's going to be stopped from being expressed. And 
it's not gone away. All the doubts and people wondering what's happening there, that mm-hmm. hasn't gone away. Like they think because they've been able to control the the kind of discourse yeah. in the in the you know the media and the acad- the academy and so on that all the people who had doubts and don't don't kind of think things are quite right that 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 they don't think that anymore or they don't seem to think that that's going to be a problem that you've got to think uh, francis it, it it looks to, to me very much like a classic case of of the emperor's new clothes um we have been told that there are 214 bodies there uh just outside the former Kamloops um, residential school um and yet People <laughs> and anybody who says, but but wait, we haven't actually seen a single body. Not a single body has been disinterred. Um, are there actually any bodies there? It's like the little kid who says, well, I can't see any clothes on the emperor. I just can't see any clothes. Yeah. And, and everybody is telling this little boy to shush up and stop. <laughs> Yeah, Stop well, embarrassing. the thing about that parable is that it's kind of assumed that once the child says this, yeah. there's this immediate kind of response and say, yeah. oh, yeah, you know, everyone kind of goes, oh, yeah, we've been in kind of, I had that doubt too, and I wasn't expressing it. Well, but we've been duped. me about this situation is that um, Nina Green, who is the, who's yeah. the primary researcher who got us all into, the, you know, discussing all these things. She's been sending out correctives mm-hmm. to journalists for now for it hasn't been a year, but it's been quite a long time. It's yes, been yes. months. It's been six months. And she's very diligent. She's dogged. She's incredible. Yes. She's an incredible researcher. Yes. And she's just continuously doing this. And it's like it doesn't like it's had a bit of it, it's had it definitely has had impact because that's why. <laughs> we've seen these sort of dissenting positions come out, but you still have the CDC and other media outlets. You'll see it quite often where they'll say, you know, the 215 bodies or the the remains. 215 unmarked graves. That's not. As if it's it's just settled fact. And it's not even the thing I said, my stuff It's not even probable. It's unlikely that it's the case. Because first of all, um, you know, if you're gonna have clandestine, because it's an apple orchard, so it's not a cemetery. There's there's situations, which is a lot around the country, where you have abandoned cemeteries where the crosses have blown away, and they yeah. were known to be cemeteries, but they've been absorbed into a, a soccer field or something like that. So there are graves there, but they're long, you yeah. know, not no longer been marked. Now, um, so that's that's you know, you're going to have, you know, 751 in the case of Mar- Maribel, uh Cemetery that's no longer, was forgotten cemetery. But in the Camelot's case, it's not a cemetery. They're talking graves, uh, secret graves being dug for um, foul play. It's, it's got to be some kind of foul play. Because murders, murders. murders. Yeah, murders or, you know, maybe an accident, which, you know, they don't want, they want to cover up or something like that. Yeah. Um, so that's 215 was the original number. And then it got downgraded to 210 because SFU archaeology department did excavations in that area where 15 of those uh, soil disturbances were, were, um, were documented yeah. by the ground penetrating radar. So it was known that there was no bodies there because they had excavated the, that area. So if those 15 were wrong, yeah. Then it's likely that the other 200 could be wrong as well. Yes. And then they see children were woken up, six year olds woken up in the middle of the night to dig the graves. Well, yeah. if you're going to dig graves as a secret, you're not going to be getting children to, to do it. And you're not going to be getting children to dig graves anyway. Anyone who's ever dug large holes knows that's not an easy thing to do. And it takes a lot for time. a six year old. The six-year-old is going to not be. And then the final thing is, there's no names of any missing children. Like, like wouldn't the 200 who never showed up for class the next day or whatever, like, wouldn't there be a name of one of these individuals or 
or wouldn't their parents have, have yeah, parents raised the issue and said, what, what, what happened to my child? Yeah. So that's not, a, that's not there either. So that hasn't happened. Um, this is highly unlikely to be the case yet. We're kind of treating it as if it's a confirmed finding, which yes. And, and we lowered our masts nationwide for more than five months. Our prime minister went to the supposed site of these 215 unmarked mass graves and laid a teddy bear at them. And this whole thing was went viral all over the world. And Canada got the reputation of a place where genocide was practiced against Indigenous people. I think Based the teddy bear just, uh, the teddy bear was at, at the Cowessus, uh, that was the 750, 751. Uh, but, oh, I'm sorry. It was uh, the other. Again, yes. But those were, but those were known. <laughs> those were not discoveries. It was known that was a cemetery for the community. It's not just indigenous children that are buried there. It's, it's, you know, priests and nuns and, and uh, there's a hospital where people who die at the hospital. Is buried. So it was just a cemetery for the community, which the yeah. crosses had blown away. And now we're, yes, we're you know, decayed. You know, and yeah. fine. You want to determine where those graves are so you can redo the markers and everything, but it's not, this is Auschwitz and big pile of bodies and everything. Like this is not the same thing we're talking about here, but you try to have a rational conversation about this to see the way you are talking about this subject is not accurate of the reality. That's what's going on. Yes. And you're immediately slammed uh, for being a genocide denier and so on. A denier. And the, thing, and the funniest thing that's happened is, and this was a long discussion we had on the research group. I'm not sure if you had joined by then, but it was about Kamloops. Yes. We had a swimming pool of in course. front of the, of the, and it was a large pool. So a hundred foot swimming pool. Yeah. So when we first saw the picture of the swimming pool, I couldn't believe it. I could, because I know that swimming pools were not all that common at that time. And that was a very large swimming pool. Expensive. And so we went through a long thing of, you know, has this been Photoshopped? Is this real? Whatever. So we searched around for outside documentation of the swimming pool. Uh, and finally, now the image of the swimming pool where it is being used in various pieces because this cannot be seen as like an Auschwitz like situation if you have, you know, a bunch of kids playing in the pool and it's like, what? This doesn't make any sense. But the hilarious thing is on my Facebook page, I've been posting these, uh, uh, all these articles. Photos? Yeah. All these articles. And one of them, the last one by James Pugh, has the swimming pool. Yes. <laughs> and I've got this troll on my. Facebook page, uh, who's a professor actually, uh, who's saying Auschwitz. At Auschwitz, people were saying that uh, there was a swimming pool at Auschwitz. So what you're doing here is exactly the same as what all the Holocaust are doing. And he even said that I was like Ernest Ernst Zundel for just saying this is oh. a seems to be a historical evidence that piece of evidence that there's a swimming pool and that these kids were given like we're swimming this is not the same thing the, the, the swimming pool at Auschwitz it's kind of an interesting story but it it was like a a water tank uh but you didn't have concentration camp prisoners you know playing and you know splashing one another and everything in this in this water containment Ike. area or something or like so and so it's this constant people just cannot give up. No. This like Nazi Germany residential school kind of comparison, which I Are think- Are they seriously still, saying that Auschwitz had a swimming pool? Yeah, so there was, there's actually a book because I, I investigated this when I heard about this. I didn't, I never heard about it, first of all, but that was the case, but there was this, uh, it, it, it was like a water, it, it held water, but it was also, I, I guess, Nazi um, officers or whatever swam in it, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know a, a lot about it, but it, it did exist. But no. it certainly was not the prisoners. It was not for the prisoners who were swimming no. in this, whatever. Right. Right. Which is not, like in the case of the, 
of the Kamloops geese. It's like there's a, you know, we just saw that today uh, uh, from uh, uh, Resistance and Renewal or no, Beyond Behind Closed Doors. It was, I think, page 39 in that book where there's a group of Kamloops school children just come back from, you know, the swimming time that they'd had. You know, it was, it was all kind of recreational. Lots of stuff like that happening in the Kamloops Residential School. Sure, there was loneliness and there was probably corporal punishment that was not, it was cruel yep. and, yep. and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But you had dancing lessons and swimming lessons and this is not a concentration. And you had choirs and you had a band and you had a hockey team and you had all these things and and the kids went on trips so that they could play hockey with other teams from other residential schools and then were, all this yeah. all this none of this has been of course publicized yeah so you know i think there has been movement since the glavin and kennedy pieces we've at least had an airing of you know mm. different views about it and hopefully that can then form the basis of new things but but still it, it's amazing the stranglehold that mm -hmm. this you know highly improbable uh type of narrative has asserted itself uh with the you know the celebration of of you know journalism uh act you know universities uh it's it's quite it's quite shocking how it, there's been just basically a clamp down on the ability to discuss it, but uh, hopefully that's in it. Two, <laughs> two hours are up, Ian. Well, well, we've covered I a know. lot of ground. I know that was really good. Um, right. Anyway, so I think our listeners have. I'd love to keep on going, but you know, two hours is quite a lot for most people to kind of you know listen to anyway. Um, yeah. But I think it was a really great conversation. And again, another more evidence that a, a conservative and a I, I assume you you see yourself as a conservative. I do. Okay, so Ian C and, and and myself, who's a historical materialist, you know, if we accept truth, yes. if we accept truth as being the the sort of guiding yes, and objective life, evidence, the objective kind of way to do things, then you can have you know, different viewpoints, uh, you know, kind of coming together and trying to figure out, you know, what the differences are. And, and perhaps we can change, you know, change our mind on a few things if we, if we feel the evidence is warranted. Anyway, I wanted to thank you so much, Ian, for joining me today on the Rational Space Disputations. I enjoyed being your guest, and I wish you every good fortune in your legal case against your university. You must win this case. Yes, it must be won. Thanks very much.